there. Welcome to Skeleton Key Productions. I'm Crown Grace Cocon. Let's get into the video. Today's video will ask the question of what if William Jennings Bryan became president in 1896? Now, just have to give a shout out to our contributor, uh, Thomas Watson. So he's the one who suggested the idea for this alternative history. Uh, we are coming to the end of the alternative history thing. So no more suggestions, please no, no more suggestions. Uh, we are, you know, so by the end of this month, we're going to be finishing this off. And then we're going to be moving on to film reviews, as we've been saying for a very long time. So definitely stay tuned for all of that. And uh, yeah, so anyway, within this, I know a lot of people won't necessarily know who William Jennings Bryan is. So we're going to give a little bit of the context of that. But before we do all that, A, obviously don't forget to hit the like button and uh, obviously subscribe if you haven't already. We're trying to hit 2000 subs by Christmas. We can do it, people. I believe in you. But what we're doing as well is we're uh, putting in a bonus question, right? So what I want you to do is in the comment section, I want you to leave a comment, yeah, writing out the answer to the question that we're going to ask now. So basically the question is, how many miles did William Jennings Bryan travel in his dumping tour of 1896? Was it 80,000 miles? Was it 18,000 miles? Or was it 8,000 miles, right? So let us know in the comment section uh, what you think it was. That will help out with the algorithm, but also just a little bit of fun. And it's also to test how well people are paying attention. So it helped me out a lot. And that being said, let's get into the actual uh, rest of the video now. So who was William Jennings Bryan? Well, first of all, he was born in 1860 uh, in the state of Illinois. But in his early uh, 20s, uh, he moved to the state of Nebraska. And by the age of 30, he'd already become a congressman uh, for Nebraska. Now, he served for two terms as a congressman there, and in 1894, uh, when he was uh, 34 years old, he tried to run for one of the Senate seats there. However, he was unsuccessful. But in this bid to become uh, one of the senators uh, for Nebraska, he had uh, already kind of built quite a name for himself, quite a reputation, and he was very well liked as, uh, as basically a man of the people, yeah. So he was very much in favour of populism, right? So we talk a lot today about populism, but the kind of roots of the populist movement can really be said to really uh, start like kind of in like at least like the 19th century, right? So you had the populist party, which was you know quite popular in many of the states, especially out west. So you can see uh, within uh, the election of 1892, you can see like uh, you know, obviously uh, they meant to pick up uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, votes there. So as a result of this, uh, whenever you have a third party that looks like it's going to like kind of uh, come up. Uh, what ends up happening is the two major parties, Democrats and Republicans, go right. We can try and like uh, uh, take these uh, these uh, some of these voters, yeah, and like help ourselves. So what the Democratic Party decided in uh, 1896 is that they wanted to go down a more populist route in order to attract some of these voters. So in 1896, in the city of Chicago, uh, there end up being the Democratic National Convention, and at that convention, the 36-year-old uh, William Jennings Bryan, he really just blew everyone away. And he did it with one of the greatest speeches of all time, right? And it's this uh, cross of gold speech. So we're gonna play an extract for you now, and then we're gonna basically talk about it uh, like kind of in more depth. I come to speak to you in defense of a cause as holy as the cause of liberty, the cause of humanity. Mr. Carlyle said in 1878 that this was a struggle between the idle holders of idle capital and the struggling masses who produce the wealth and pay the taxes of the country. So in the first part of this speech, you can hear him talk about, you know, like the cause of humanity. And he's setting up, as with all populists, yeah, a kind of us versus them paradigm, right? So, you, you know, he's talking about the, you know, the idle holders of idle capital versus the great struggling masses. You know, so he's very much like pitting the kind of the basically the business elite. Uh, versus uh, the people right so you can already see this kind of paradigm which is uh, pushing through this is like really his uh, populist uh, rhetoric like coming to fall they tell us that the great cities are in favor of the gold standard we reply that the great cities rest upon our broad and fertile prairies burn down your cities and leave our farms and your cities will spring up again as if by magic but destroy our farms and the grass will grow in the streets of every city of the country. Now with that next bit that you just heard, you can hear him talking about a gold standard. So I just have to explain what a gold standard is very quickly. So the gold standard is basically, uh, at, in, in, at the turn of like the last century, uh, England in particular uh, pushed for, for forward uh, a gold standard. So most of the developed countries around the world 
have a gold standard. So what that means is that the currency of each country is pegged to what the gold standard is, right? So, so, so whatever the price of gold is, uh, that's what your currency is kind of going to be uh, largely based around. So this is good in some ways because it means that uh, like gold, well, historically gold doesn't fluctuate so much right so it, unless there's a, like a new uh, a gold mine that comes out or unless there's a huge like kind of a, a, a reduction in the supply of gold for some reason for the most part gold tends to keep a steady price so if your currency is based to that that means that your currency is stable you end up having very low rates of inflation and so like it makes uh, prices very predictable so this benefits people who are like primarily con consumers as uh, so the people who live in big cities and also like business elites because like it makes trade easier for them so those are the people who are in favor of the gold standard right however what Jen and Brian was basically saying is no let's not have the gold standard because the gold standard while it helps people in the cities and it helps big business it doesn't help the farmers so during this time just 40 percent of America's uh, population was rural in many ways America was a developing country at that time so obviously it was very huge and it was like it was very much uh, growing and stuff and it had already uh, overtaken England at this time in terms of both the, uh, the largest uh, uh, economy by GDP as well as uh, the largest one by GDP per capita However, it was still a situation where most of the population are living in the countryside and therefore their interests are not being uh, maintained by this gold standard. And the reason for that is because, as we said before, in terms of uh, 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 the, the prices, right? So farmers are self-reliant, so they don't tend to buy that much. And yet what they do is obviously they sell. So for them, they're not really bothered if the price of things go up in terms of them as consumers. But what they are more worried about is the fact of uh, over time, if you're having low levels of inflation, that uh, the amount of money that they're getting is is going to be reduced, right? So what they want is in terms of for sales, they want there to be an introduction of inflation because at this time you actually had a deflation uh, within, uh, the, the, uh, within like, the US money supply. So instead of money becoming worth less, it ends up becoming worth more, which sounds like it's bad, but you need ideally at least two percent inflation just to kind of like keep the, the economy going and it's long to explain this, uh, this is not an economics lecture but just so you kind of get the bare understanding of it and then go out and do more research for yourself so that's the situation right the farmers they want inflation the people in the cities don't want inflation so when brian is talking he's also setting up another us versus them which is basically you know the rural population versus the urban population now Pay attention to this because this will have ramifications uh, later on, right? In particular, because the urban population varies across the country, right? So in the South, where the Democratic Party is very popular at this time, you know, the urban population is just 18%. However, in the Midwest, it's at 39%. And in the Western territories, it's at 40%. When it comes to the Northeast, the urban population there is at 66% already. So it's a highly urbanized society. And so... Uh, Brian trying to run on this platform is not going to go down very well uh, there. Uh, also, it didn't help the fact of, you know, Chicago, where he was doing the speech a few years ago, it had just burnt down. So 25 years before this, there had been the Great Fire of Chicago. And yeah, it didn't, yeah, uh, this didn't go down very well for the people there. Yeah, it's a bit like going to New York and making a 9-11 joke. It's not really something that one would do, right? Um, so that's basically kind of what he, he's talking about here. We care not upon what line the battle is fought. If they say bimetallism is good, but that we cannot have it until other nations help us, we reply that instead of having a gold standard, because England has, we will restore bimetallism, and then let England have bimetallism, because the United States has. If they dare to come out in the open field and defend the gold standard as a good thing, we will fight them to the uttermost. Now, in the bit that you just heard then, uh, he's basically talking about this kind of like this anti-English uh, rhetoric. So, so as we kind of said, um, like, uh, you know, America is rising at this point and, uh, and Britain, although it's still the era of Pax Britannica, so like you know, the, the era when uh, Britain is the global hegemon, it's now a situation where that hegemony is being challenged by uh, the, the ascendant America. Very much like how uh, China is rising now and, it, and it's uh, threatening uh, a, a US hegemony. So now we live in the era of 
of uh, Pax Americana, but the rise of China is now threatening that. So it's very similar as to like what was happening back then. So many people in America were still very hostile to the English. Uh, they still obviously remembered uh, the revolution and they remembered like the war of 1812. So for them, they saw England as a major threat. So he's basically stirring up a uh, nationalist rhetoric when he's talking about, oh, well, like, you know, like, you know, basically uh, when he's like uh, talking against uh, England in this sense. Having behind us the producing masses of this nation and the world, supported by the commercial interests, the laboring interests, and the toilers everywhere, we will answer their demand for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. And now with that final bit, you can hear him talking about internationalism. Yeah, you can hear him talking about how America is going to basically be a world leader and how like America will be on the side of like the, the, the struggling masses like throughout the whole world. And he's using his religious imagery because obviously don't forget he's an evangelical. He's very, very much uh, like a, a strong believer in God and, and like in, in, in like, the Christian faith. And so he's using this religious imagery where he's talking about this crown of thorns, you know, alluding to uh, Jesus Christ and obviously talking about this cross of gold. Yeah, like so when you talk about cross of gold and he, he's talking about the gold standard, he's saying that mankind will not be crucified on this cross of gold. We will not be crucified by this gold standard. So this speech was absolutely electrifying, so much so that Brian was actually uh, carried on his shoulder out of the convention. And yeah, so he ended up just winning the nomination, right? And to this day, Winnington Jennings Bryan is still the youngest person to ever be nominated by a major party in America. And he still is the youngest person to ever have any electoral college votes yet in any election. Because obviously one has to be uh, 35 years old or above in order to run uh, for the presidency and he was uh, 36 years old at the time of doing the speech. Now while his populism obviously appealed to the, the kind of broad masses and stuff and especially like the, uh, the base of the, the Democratic Party, for many people in like the establishment uh, of like the Democratic Party they were very much opposed to this yeah so many of them were obviously uh, very wealthy like kind of northerners and many of them were kind of like had like business interests etc etc and so out of protest these guys left and they formed their own party which called the National Democratic Party. So this is a party which stood uh, for gold uh, and, and for maintaining the gold standard. Now they got some votes in the election, uh, it wasn't significant, it wasn't enough to kind of like sway the election either way but it's just something to note that like it wasn't you know his, his platform wasn't universally liked of course and within this as well his populism obviously it appealed to some people but it obviously distanced himself from other people as well. But in the course of the election, you know, one thing that he had on his side was the fact of A, obviously he's very young and B, obviously he has a lot of energy and C, as you've heard in the speech there, he's a very, very good orator. So what he does is he does something which is revolutionary, right? It's never been done in an election before. And basically what he does is a stumping tour. He does like a, 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 a I don't know what the, the, the phrase is, like a whistle tour, or no, stop whistle tour, I don't know what it is. Anyway, however, the point is, yeah, uh, that he travels around like uh, the Midwest, which is obviously where all like the swing states are even today. And this is where he does a lot of his campaigning, right? So in the space of three months, he travels 18,000 miles by rail across 27 states and he speaks to 5 million uh, people, right? So in the space of these three months, he's doing over 500 speeches, right? As a matter of fact, in one day alone in St. Louis, he did 36 speeches in just one day. And obviously, as a result of this, his voice ended up being very strained, uh, so much so that uh, when he went to uh, like each uh, rally, uh, he'd say, oh, well, I left my voice uh, at the previous rally, right? So, yeah, so very, very popular, like, yeah, yeah the, the crowds wherever he went were ecstatic. And so one would imagine from this level of energy that he had this thing in the bag, right? especially when compared uh, to his uh, opponent, who was much older and also just had a very much, how should we say, a much more laid back approach to this, right? So while William Jennings Bryan did this crazy tour where he's traveling all about the place, his opponent, William uh, McKinley, who we've discussed in our previous video about, uh, you know, uh, what if uh, Teddy Roosevelt never became president, definitely check that out. Uh, you know, so what he did uh, instead was a so-called front porch campaign where he sat, on his front porch and just expected the voters to come to him but it wasn't as simple as that because he didn't just do that instead what he did is he uh, hired a very competent uh, campaign manager and this guy was called mark hannah 
And Mark Hanna did something very, very revolutionary, right? This election set so many precedents here yeah, in terms of like presidential elections, right? So what he did is instead of just, you know, appealing to people and be like, hey, can we just have some donations? What he did is instead go directly to businesses and he said, right, you guys need to give us money to help us win. Because if you don't, if William Jennings Bryan becomes president, your business interests are going to be affected by this, right? So you need to donate money. Now, this ended up having a huge, huge effect, right? So while William Jennings Bryan was going about and like, you know, so at each rally, he'd like pass like a hat round or something and be like, okay, put in your donations there. He managed to raise uh, like half a million uh, dollars, right? So, you know, 500,000. Uh, William McKinley, in contrast, raised 3.5 million. So McKinley was able to outspend uh, Brian by a factor of seven to one, right? So if you know anything about elections, unless it's like, a, like just some crazy, crazy election, yeah, for the most part, whoever ends up raising the most money ends up being the side that wins, right? So that's kind of a bit of a prelude to what's going to come later. But for now, we're just going to keep explaining a bit more about the election of 1896. Now, this election really can be seen as one between, you know, the people who are uh, fighting on the side of big business and those who are fighting on the side of the people, right? And one of the things that we can clearly see from this is the fact that business leaders put uh, signs up at their businesses on the day of the election and said, basically, if Brian ends up winning, don't bother coming into work tomorrow because our business will shut down. So obviously these kind of tactics here yeah, really scared uh, a lot of uh, workers. Um, and so, yeah, this is part of the reason why 59% of uh, urbanites across the country end up voting for McKinley. And also didn't help as well, as we said, like in terms of like for inflation, obviously for, for factory workers, for people who are working in the cities and stuff, they are going to be negatively affected by inflation. So for them, they're like, no, we, we don't want inflation. And then also, as I said, the kind of rhetoric which Brian had about uh, city folk, they found it very alienated. For instance, when uh, Brian went to New York, uh, he famously uh, said, oh, I'm, I'm going through enemy country now. Which again, if you're trying to like uh, win elections and stuff, it's not great kind of like having that mindset of like, you know, if you're trying to govern people and stuff, yeah, you don't want to like set up a division between you and them. So it also didn't help as well uh, that uh, obviously this was a time of uh, mass migration to America. So obviously you had many people from all around uh, Europe uh, in particular uh, coming to America. And in particular, you end up having a Catholic Irish and also Catholic Germans, right? So these groups, for two reasons in particular, are not very happy uh, with uh, what Brian had to offer. First of all, he's an evangelical, so this is a time at which uh, like, there was still a lot of rivalry between uh, Protestantism and Catholicism, and so him basically like uh, doing this kind of stumping tour where he's basically like coming across as like an evangelical and stuff, and we'll get onto that a bit later in terms of just how evangelical he was, uh, but for, for them, they found that quite alienating. And then on top of that as well, uh, there was the fact of, you know, he was a prohibitionist, right? So obviously we know that like prohibition uh, uh, came to America in, uh, in uh, the 1920s and that's where it became like a federal law and became part of the constitution. But a long time before that, it was really quite a movement and like it kind of had spread across a lot of the states. So there were many people who was in favour of prohibition even then. And so these uh, Irish Catholics and obviously that, uh, these Germans, yeah, both of which have a great reputation for being a drinker as well. Great, not necessarily in a good sense, but like they, they have a big uh, reputation uh, for being uh, uh, drunkards. Um, so for them, they were very much like, uh, no, we don't want uh, to vote for this guy because I, you know, they might impose a, a prohibition on us and that will hurt our businesses and just like our way of like just having fun, basically. So that was another reason that he, they were kind of like deterred from uh, voting for him. So now it's the day of the election in 1896 and here are the results. So William Jennings Bryan ends up losing uh, to McKinley and so McKinley ends up getting 271 electoral college uh, votes while Bryan gets just 176. Uh, at the same time uh, McKinley ends up with 51% of the of, of the popular vote and um, uh, Bryan just gets 46.7%. Uh, 
So Brian tends to do very well in the south and in the west of the country, because as we said, you know, the, uh, it was the solid south at that point uh, for the Democrats. And then also uh, when it came to out west, uh, like that's where the populists um, uh, were very popular. So during this campaign, there was basically a fusion between the Democratic Party, the Silver uh, Party. They also had a break off a uh, Silver Republican p uh, Party as well, and also the populists, right? So all of these like kind of minor parties kind of came uh, together and, and backed up Brian like, uh, during this race, yeah. But even still with this alliance, he still wasn't able to, uh, to win it, right? Now we're going to get onto the kind of what if of this video a little bit later, but for now let's just continue talking about William Jennings Bryan, right? So, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And certainly William Jennings Bryan was the living embodiment of this, right? So, he failed in 1896, so what he did is he ran again in 1900 and he ended up losing even more spectacularly than he did the first time. And the reason for that is because in 1896, uh, you know, a few years before that, you had the panic of 1893. So this was an economic depression, which really hit the country really hard. And so people were still kind of uh, living through the effects of that. However, by the time of 1900, you had this kind of return of prosperity. And also two years before this, you'd had a Spanish-American war. So, you know, Brian was very much in support of the war as well as most Americans were because, you know, you had the attack on like the USS Maine. And so, you know, like the Americans kind of thought, yeah, this is a good war to fight and to kick the Spanish out of the Philippines and Cuba and Puerto Rico and, and Guam. But what Brian uh, was against was imperialism, right? So America end up uh, basically having an empire as a result of this war. So they took uh, the Philippines, they took Puerto Rico, they took Guam, and they also, uh, for a number of years, uh, uh, held uh, uh, Cuba. Uh, so this is basically, you know, this is imperialism. And obviously, for many people in America, they were very much opposed to this because they had previously been a colonial holding of the, the British. So they were instinctively opposed to imperialism in that sense. So that was a platform that he stood on. However, it still wasn't enough to kind of like, you know, get him over the line. And so the result of the 1900 election was as follows. McKinley, who ran again, uh, got 292 electoral college votes, uh, while Bryan just got 155. And in terms of the popular vote, it was 51.6% for McKinley and for just 55.5% uh, for Bryan. Yeah, so you can really see the difference here. Some of the states end up being lost, which uh, Brian had held before. And this is partly because in 1900, you had the very young uh, Teddy Roosevelt, who was running on uh, as the vice presidential uh, candidate uh, for uh, McKinley. You know, so with the kind of like youthful energy combined with the kind of like populist uh, message that Teddy Roosevelt had, it managed to gain quite a lot of people that uh, uh, Brian had held before. This is part of the reason why in 1904, Brian did not run uh, for, for the Democratic Party because he was like, actually, you know what, Teddy Roosevelt is basically taking many of my ideas and he's basically running with that, so let's just stay out of it. However, in 1908, William Jones Bryan comes back because he ended up having the more conservative uh, Republican, uh, who is uh, William Taft. You know, so Taft was very much running against uh, what uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, uh, had stood for. And so Brian was like, right, this is my chance now to, like, to, to go for it. And... He ended up losing even more spectacularly this third time than he did the first two times. As a matter of fact, uh, what Taft uh, uses as part of his campaign slogan is vote for Taft now. You can vote for Brian anytime in, in the kind of allusion to how many times like people have had a chance to vote them already. So as a result of this, you know, uh, Brian ends up uh, bowing out of politics and he still continues to be a very uh, influential person. Most notably, of course, in the 1925 uh, monkeys trial, so the Scopes monkey trial. This is to do with uh, like creationism and this is, you know, so, so uh, like within American schools, especially in like, the Bible Belt, uh, it was banned uh, to teach uh, like the theory of evolution. And so basically Brian being the evangelical uh, 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 Christian that he was, he uh, w took the side of the prosecution. So he was trying to prosecute the teacher who was uh, teaching evolution. And particularly you can see this in the film Inherit the Wind. Uh, so they changed the names up a little bit, but it's a really, really good film. It's going to be on one of our film reviews. So definitely stay tuned for that. But like, you know, it's a really, really good film, which basically covers that uh, trial. And just like the character that is alluded to uh, as being Brian, just as that character ends up dying uh, at the end of that uh, uh, film, yeah, so too does uh, William Jennings Bryan in real life. So he died in 1925 during this uh, uh, monkey trial. And yeah, so that's just the end of William Jennings Bryan. But this is not the only time when William Jennings Bryan plays a part in pop culture, right? So Wizard of Oz 
some people have alluded and obviously like it's it's all up in the air these kind of things right but some people have alluded that it's an allegory for the america of the time that it was written right so dorothy represents the american republic who have like lost their way and they need to follow the yellow brick road which is you know the gold standard you know but like in the original play uh, unlike in the film she's wearing silver shoes right you know so this is alluding to bimetallism right on top of that, of course, you have uh, the Scarecrow and he represents uh, like kind of uh, 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 the rural population, like kind of, you know, they don't have a brain, but like, you know, they're, they're good people and stuff. Then obviously you've got the Tin Man and he represents uh, the kind of like industrial workers who, you know, they're smart and stuff, but they don't have a heart. And of course, the Cowardly Lion is said to be representative of William Jennings Bryan. I don't fully get the reason why he's considered the cowardly lion and also as well with all these things there's always a debate about the you know it, it one can uh, sometimes end up uh, running the risk of being like kind of an English literature student uh, where one over interprets things but it still is quite interesting right and I, I highly recommend you to, to look into it a little bit more because we are going to cover that as well when we talk uh, about uh, a Wizard of Oz uh, at some point when we do film reviews definitely stay tuned for that. But now we're going to come to the bit that you've all been waiting for, and that is the what if, right? So the alternative history part of this, how does he end up winning the election of 1896? I think that how he does this is, first of all, from the very beginning where he does the Cross of Gold speech, lay off the, the, you know, the attacks on, on urban uh, voters, right? It doesn't benefit you to do this. If, if you're going to have an us versus them, just have an us versus them in terms of the elite versus the people, right? Uh, by just you just unnecessarily alienate people right whenever you're trying to do an election you want to try and appeal to as many people as possible as soon as you start having us versus them which is such a huge like swathe of the country like you know why is it that urban voters couldn't kind of get on the same side as you you need to win these people over instead of seeing them as basically the enemy right you know so maybe if he'd be able to do this maybe we would be able to get this across the line especially if he'd kind of uh, dampened the fear that was kind of quite rampant at the time of inflation right so if he kind of made the point of well actually we're going through a stage of like of deflation so a little bit of inflation won't hurt anyone and, and also the kind of fear mongering that people are saying about it is just just chill out and stuff right so if he kind of dissuaded uh, these kind of fears and also pointing out to people a bit more like look at the business interest yeah they're trying to scare you in terms of saying you're going to become broke and you're going to lose your job etc etc so if somehow he was able to rally that there's only seven states that he needed to win in order to become the president, right? And actually, the margin of uh, victory, it was just in uh, 43,000 uh, people, right? Or a little bit less than 43,000 people. So if he'd managed to get 43,000 um, extra votes in these seven states, he could have won that election and he could have been uh, one of the presidents of America. Mm. So what would have been different if he had become president? Well, first of all, of course, you end up having the progressive era, which came after this. And in many ways, although Brian didn't end up winning, he still was very influential within the kind of setting up of, of that movement. Right. So I think within the middle of this gilded age, which America was going through, I think that uh, like he would have uh, enacted more populist uh, policies, which would have uh, helped like the broad masses of the people a lot more. On top of that as well, when it came to the war with Spain, he would have you know, kicked uh, the Spanish out of Cuba, Puerto Rico, uh, Philippines and Guam, but he wouldn't have kept US troops there. He wouldn't have continually occupied there. So instead of America becoming an imperial power, he would have basically just kept them as uh, you know, America focusing it on itself. Yeah, we also forgot to mention as well that McKinley uh, was very much in favour of the annexation of the Kingdom of Hawaii. So, you know, Hawaii was its own independent kingdom at the time in 1898. However, the US took that uh, place over, made it a US territory, and later obviously it became a US state. So if this hadn't happened, if you think about the long-term ramification of this when it comes to World War II, how did America get into World War II? Pearl Harbor. Where's Pearl Harbor? In Hawaii. Where else did they end up attacking? Guam and also the Philippines, right? So if America hadn't been there, long term, would they necessarily have got into World War II? Perhaps, but it's much more unlikely, right? It's also not to rule out the fact of like, you know, maybe a later president might have taken these territories anyway, but the precedents for it would have been much less had this not happened at this time. And also something to think about as well is that if Brian ends up basically being the, you know, the man who like everyone thinks about when they think about populism, yeah, when they think about this kind of new progressive era, how popular would someone like Teddy Roosevelt have been? 
So we covered that in our previous video, like I said, about Teddy Roosevelt, right? Maybe Teddy Roosevelt would never have become president. And as we discussed in that video, that has huge, huge ramifications for what ends up happening uh, for the rest of the century. You know, because this is when America becomes a great military power, yeah, it becomes one of the, the major world powers. So, you know, there's lots of ramification from this. And hopefully what I've shown with this is that the election of 1896 is still very, very important, uh, both for America and for the rest of the world. So if you didn't know about it before, now you know. So if you uh, like that video, don't forget to obviously to hit the like button, subscribe as well. Uh, we're trying to get to 2000 subs, like we said, by Christmas. We can do it, people. I believe in you. And also in the comment section, don't forget to write down what the answer to the bonus question was. So how many miles did uh, William Jennings uh, travel across the country? Was it 80,000 miles? Was it 18,000 miles? Or was it 8,000 miles, right? So leave that in the comment section, right? It will help out the algorithm. And the next video is going to be about another person uh, who uh, might have become president, and that is ron paul right so we talk about the election of uh, 2012 so it's all within our living memories right uh so that's what we're going to discuss in the next video but in the meantime have a great day and bye